definitely has something to hide. This exists to the point of absolute information and media blackout in the Valley of Kashmir imposed by the Indian state, which shows a regime of repression, intolerance, and fascism. Even Indian television channels are not allowed to, repeat, to report freely from the Valley. Muzammil Jamil of the Indian Express wrote, Kashmir has been turned invisible even inside Kashmir. Journalists have been imprisoned and gone missing after daring to criticize the Modi regime. International reputable media outlets like BBC and the Al Jazeera are targeted and discredited falsely for presenting fake and fabricated footage from the valley. The BBC and Reuters ran stories about massive protests in the region. Both outlets reported that authorities used tear gas to, protest, to disperse protesters. The BBC shared a video that appears to show police firing on um, protesters, yet the government continues to deny the footage. And instead, it has further imposed restrictions on access to the press to the valley directly, uh, denying the world's right to know about the government's increasingly fascist maneuvers in the valley. Ladies and gentlemen, a slightly different yet similar situation also exists in Pakistan, whereby although television channels are mushrooming at an unprecedented rate, yet existing seasoned journalists are facing threats and intimidation for being critical of the status quo, that is, forcing an atmosphere of fear and self-censorship. According to some journalists, this has been one of the worst regimes that have done that have imposed a, a, a crackdown on journalists, and some even say that it is worse than uh, dictatorial regimes, for example, the one of Zia, which is very popular for imposing its censorship. Several international media watchdogs have called out the draconian orders issued by FAMRA in this regard, that is, the Pakistan's electronic media regulatory authority. While some information platforms like the Voice of America, Pashto Language Radio Service were taken down, several media outlets have had to downsize as a result of financial constraints. And according to journalists, this is another soft tactic of controlling media and journalists in Pakistan. Media, ladies and gentlemen, is the fourth pillar of democracy. It has a responsibility to expose the ills in our society and aid the government in identifying and correcting them. It also has a responsibility to empower people to make informed decisions, and thereby it carries massive influence. However, while it is absolutely essential to have a vibrant and free press in Pakistan, responsible journalism is also necessary, otherwise it becomes detrimental to the very freedoms that it is supposed to secure and preserve. Thus, striking the right balance is extremely important. In order to discuss this critical issue at hand, we have a very important panel with us today. And without much further ado, I'd like to invite a very prominent journalist from Pakistan, a foreign policy commentator and a leading TV personality. With almost three decades of experience in the fields of conflict reporting, parliamentary and electoral politics and the public policy discourse. He has interviewed global personalities like Margaret Thatcher, Hillary Clinton, Mahathir Mohammed, Benazir Bhutto and our current Prime Minister Imran Khan. Please join me in welcoming Talat Hussain. Thank you very much, uh, Manur. Uh, delighted to be here, uh, all of you. Uh, great to be in the company of uh, illustrious uh, uh, co-panelists, uh, whose uh, job is much more difficult than mine because you'll be looking at the juicier part of uh, the seminar. I am only dealing with the drab part of the seminar, which is Kashmir. So I'll keep it uh, simple for you uh, because censorship has sort of more uh, provocation attached to it, um, and Kashmir has a censorship <coughs> problem, but it also has. Um, a dispute related problem. Uh, in journalism we say that we choose our stories as reporters but uh, we don't choose our headlines. Headlines are made by the desk. So I have a bit of an issue with the sort of bracketing of um, Kashmir with you know India and Pakistan censorship but that's a headline that we didn't choose. Just to make that point that I will be discussing Kashmir not in the context of censorship only but looking at it from the multiple di um, <coughs> dimensions of this being a dispute and what, where it, how it started and where it will go. I have pre prepared a small presentation for you. Um, I believe that the, I'm not a PowerPoint presentation fan, frankly, because I believe that world's problems are caused by PowerPoint presentations. We compress very complex uh, issues into very small bullet points and make it look uh, very uh, deep. 
uh, but in respect of time, I have to do that. So you know, uh, bear with me as I roll the, the presentation. Um, basically, the, <coughs> that's my uh, upfront statement. That's the uh, the thesis that I'm working with. Uh, unlike uh, those who do research, journalists have the um, the license to basically put the conclusion at the beginning of uh, the article. So that's the, the beginning of my article, and that's what my conclusion is. So if you look at, um, India has created a new map, uh, and uh, uh, this map may look new in terms of its contours and uh, the association that it has developed uh, with a Kashmir state, which is not defunct. But it's an unfolding of decades of policy that India had adopted and culminated in a policy that is pursued and espoused by BJP. So that's what my thesis is. Um, the original view of Kashmir that Delhi used to take now is in the dustbin of history. It's almost as if uh, India created a Fukuyama who said that you know history has ended without a question mark uh, in Kashmir and we are now starting a new history, how it existed, where it was, doesn't really matter. But it, it's important to get your perspective right, uh, so I'm going to take you through uh, a couple of slides that will tell you how India used to look at Kashmir. Uh, and these are you know, factually accurate uh, citations. Um, we have tried to be as uh, factual and honest about their citations, uh, references as possible, but uh, error here and there can't be ruled out. Uh, so how did Delhi actually used to look at uh, the issue of Kashmir? You know, the one core issue as the dispute was initially known is the finality uh, of the accession. Was the accession to the Indian state uh, of the disputed Kashmir part uh, final or not? Uh, and I'm quoting statements that you need to read yourself uh, from Jawaharlal Nehru and uh, his, uh, his telegram to the Prime Minister of Pakistan, which uh, make the Indian stance absolutely very clear that the accession to the Indian state uh, was not final. It was a temporary arrangement. It was supposed to be an uh, interregnum created by uh, the invaders uh, from the Pakistani territories, which created a situation that the Indians had to respond to. So there was nothing final as far as Delhi was concerned uh, about the accession to the Indian states. These are just two statements. I, I have a whole plethora of them, but I thought, just thought that it's important to make this point. Delhi used to believe, once upon a time, that accession uh, had uh, no finality. Uh, what about Pabisit? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, again, I quote uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, who say that we have decided that the fate of Kashmir is ultimately to be decided by the people. When I read these things, they sound so much like a Pakistani leader making these statements. That's the remarkable part about it. So if you read the um, order of the Indian leaders' statements before the UN, uh, in telegrams to and communications to Pakistani uh, leaders and uh, to their own parliament, to the Kashmiri assembly, they almost sound like somebody from Pakistan today is saying, uh, these things, but these are things that are coming really from the uh, Indian citation. Uh, look at the last one. We have not opposed at any time an overall plebiscite for the state as a whole. So of course they are sort of keeping their options open as well, asking the Pakistanis to vacate the Azad Kashmir and you know, let a plebiscite be held in the entire uh, state. But their point is very clear that plebiscite uh, is an option and they don't oppose it. Uh, what is Kashmiri's weightage? Once upon a time, again, they used to look at Kashmiris uh, being the ultimate arbiters of their own fate. When, when the paramount seat ended, um, whose rights were vested in whom, and Indians were very clear on that. Indian leadership was very clear on that, that the uh, valleys of the state were the people. They were the real sovereigns, and they had to decide. Again, as I say this, I make it sound as if you know I'm reading a press release from the Pakistan Foreign Office, but that's not what it is. That's how the Indians used to look at, uh, and this is a report that was submitted to the All India Congress Committee, and the date is uh, given there as well. Was this uh, self-determination uh, supposed to be conditional, or was it supposed to be unfettered, that is sort of in totality? Uh, was it uh, uh, supposed to be uh, subject to certain uh, conditions, or was it supposed to be uh, up there as a principle, and it makes it very clear we have accepted Kashmir's offer of accession at a time when she was in peril, we will not hold in the circumstances, hold her to this accession as an unalterable fact or decision on her part. 
he will be free by means of a plebiscite, either to ratify our accession to India or to change her mind and accede to Pakistan or remain independent. These are all three options which are coming out of the Indian narrative on Kashmir again, once upon a time. That's the kind of history that we don't hear about or, or talk about. Uh, I'll skip this. Uh, Indian Association of Kashmir, it was supposed to be a temporary occupation. There was nothing final about uh, Kashmir joining India. There was nothing final about it being uh, integrated into the Indian uh, Union territory. It was supposed to be, uh, Indian forces were supposed to be there for a very short period of time. Again, there are international commitments uh, available. What did they think of the UN CIP resolutions? That's, again, a very interesting uh, take. Uh, we talk about the United uh, Nations Security Council or uh, Committee for, or Commission for India and Pakistan resolutions, but again, they now sound like an archaic uh, fragment of history that nobody uh, wants to uh, look at. But uh, uh, Madam pa Pandit, uh, who was the sister of uh, uh, Nehru, uh, and as a remarkable woman, the first woman to uh, be the president of the UN General Assembly, uh, a great diplomat, she committed uh, uh, to implementing uh, the resolutions in letter and spirit and she said that you know we do not want to bypass these resolutions these are all commitments which are international in nature uh, Krishnan uh, Menon again a formidable diplomat uh, you know a great representative of uh, India again committed to implementing these decisions um, let me skip to and see uh, what the present state of Kashmir is now now all the solutions and they have been uh, not one, not two, but at least 14 uh, countable solutions proposed to the Indian problem, uh, the Kashmir problem. And uh, the, it ranges from, say, soft borders to a joint uh, custody to um, limited sovereignty to, you know, multiple formulas, at least 14. And these were solutions which were not conceived by theoreticians. These were solutions that were uh, conceived by diplomats from both these countries. Uh, under the ages of the international uh, either organizations or um, international players. Um, there was you know, one solution that uh, Jawaharlal Nehru was uh, deeply uh, interested in and uh, Secretary Dallas was negotiating that. It was partly reported uh, recently uh, with the Pakistani leaders and the Cold War intervened and Pakistan joined the American camp and that solution you know, uh, again became in the category, category of neither here nor there. But there, were, there have been solutions. From the day uh, the Kashmir problem started uh, till uh, General Bajwa time, and here I'm sort of giving you some news as well. From the day uh, the Indian uh, the Kashmir problem started to General Bajwa's time, India and Pakistan have been deeply engaged in trying to find a solution. The latest attempt, just before uh, the last uh, set of uh, steps by uh, the Indians, uh, was um, Ajit Doval's engagement with the Pakistanis uh, in some remote. Uh, corner of Southeast Asia. It always happens to be either in Bangkok or Singapore or somewhere. And just before the Indians actually took that step, Pakistanis reportedly had like five rounds with the Indians trying to find out a workable solution to the Kashmir problem along with a couple of other problems that we have with India. You now what uh, triggered the ultimate Indian somersault on that last engagement, we do not know. But our sense is that Indians from that engagement uh, with Pakistanis uh, concluded that Pakistanis are desperate for some sort of a peace and they went back and reported. That's our interpretation of it. Uh, and Modi thought that this is the right time to basically do what he had always been planning. So rather than taking the peace process forward, they concluded that Pakistanis were in no position to now uh, you know, fight with the Indians or they are so desperate to have a solution with the, uh, with the Indians that now we can uh, create this new uh, map of India and Pakistanis will not be able to respond to that. And so far, frankly, that assumption has been proven to be quite accurate. So the, the attempt to find a solution to Kashmir problem, that's the long and short of it, uh, has uh, a history as old as the history of the dispute itself. What is India trying to do? Uh, India is basically integrating uh, the territory and the people through economic assimilation and social reorganization. I think Indian strategy is long term. Uh, they are uh, going to throw a lot of money in uh, what we call uh, Indian administered or occupied Kashmir and all what they call their state and Kashmir state doesn't exist. Uh, they will be a massive investment. You will have um, a lot of multinationals moving in, international money pouring in. 
and do not be surprised if the Americans uh, are building their uh, own networks and corporations starting their offices in, in the occupied uh, territory. So India will be using a lot of money to basically create an economic incentive against violence and resistance. So that's one strategy. The other is social reorganization, which essentially means that you bring in more people from other parts of uh, uh, India and not try to change the demographic balance, but try to create a constituency within Kashmir, which is going to be a dilutory effect on uh, the region as well. So that's one. They are also developing a global stake in the new uh, Kashmir history, as they call it. Just to give you one example, uh, one reason Chinese are really worried about uh, what happened in Kashmir is not because they love us so much. Um, that they don't these days because of what we did to stand back. Um, they are worried because uh, there apparently is an agreement between the Indians uh, and the Americans to allow America uh, a toehold or a base in Ladakh. So if that were to happen, regardless of whether Americans stay in, in uh, Afghanistan or not, uh, they will be sitting at the jugular vein of the Chinese, and the Chinese do not like that. So Chinese take on Kashmir is not what is happening in the valley. Chinese take on Kashmir in very centers around Ladakh itself, which is a sort of fine point that generally doesn't become uh, apparent. But that's the new stake that India is creating of the global powers in ensuring that the new map of India is unalterable. Third is the weakening of the diplomatic cards used by Pakistan, uh, which is pretty apparent. The whole narrative, and we heard that in a uh, remarkable seminar that was uh, organized uh, yesterday at Chatham House. Uh, the whole argument is that you know, unless and until you stop um, terrorism uh, in Kashmir, we are not going to talk to you. So not talking to Pakistan, a demolishing Pakistani argument uh, of sort of moral and legal standing on Kashmir is going to be a consistent policy. So these are the things that the Indians are trying to do. Where will Kashmir go from here? Our assessment is that there is going to be a solidification of the new status quo that will continue. So it is pretty much an irreversible process that they have unleashed. That's how we see things now. If the information base changes from a couple of months now, we may be able to reach a different conclusion. But we are suggesting that uh, this status quo is going to continue to be deepened. Uh, loss of initiative for Pakistan, we already see Pakistan's uh, initiative on Kashmir kind of petering out, running out of uh, steam. Uh, the whole um, you know, hyperventilation in the initial few weeks has now settled down to a more grim, uh, cliche kind of a routine. A couple of headlines there, a couple of headlines there. Somebody standing in front of Eiffel Tower, others standing you know, somewhere in a nondescript place elsewhere. That's about the best initiative that we have taken so far on Kashmir. So uh, Indians are playing for time. Um, we may have the high moral ground, but as the Taliban used to say in Afghanistan, we have the watches. And we have the time. They have the watches and we have the time. So Indians have the time. So they're going to play, play it out and let it roll and dilute the initiative, which is not going anywhere. Anyways, uh, there's going to be low grade simmering of discontent that will continue to create greater chances of a bilateral uh, conflict. You know, the internal frustration within Pakistan of seeing the Kashmir uh, being taken away right under their noses is going to create huge problems for the political and military leadership inside Pakistan. And you know, some of that scene is going to come out in very strange ways. Um, so we do not rule out the possibility of a you know, bigger, larger conflict not related to, uh, to Kashmir, but because of the fact that so many frustrations have been bottled up now and Pakistan initiative doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And conversely, the Indians are on a high. And when a sort of more dominant power is on a high, uh, do not um, uh, trust their judgment. They can also make egregious strategic mistakes. So the mistakes can't be just made by Pakistanis only. Indians may also have a miscalculation. <coughs> Last, that's the more important one, and connects directly with the next <coughs> panel's uh, talk. Pakistan's economic situation and internal arrangement will define the big length depth of its response. Um, Pakistan's diplomatic leeway has shrunk remarkably, and that has a direct correlation with Pakistan's very bad economic situation. I was thinking of as a heavier word, but you know, this will do. Very bad economic situation. Our diplomatic leverage has shrunk proportionate to uh, where our economy stands. So if your economy is growing like a 2.4%, uh, the new statistics I was looking at are even more uh, you know, problematic, like a little under 2. Uh, for the next three years, uh, that's not the kind of economy that will give you a lot of diplomatic leverage. 
And if internal upheavals continue, our diplomatic uh, uh, leeway vis-a-vis -vis India is going to continue to shrink. So on that dour and sour and dark note, I wind up my, uh, my presentation. Thank you very much for your patience. As I told you, the juicy part is coming up now. Mine was the boss. Thank you very much. I generally avoid PowerPoint. I hope you can hear me clearly at the back. Um, it's, it's a traditional way of doing it, so um, I hope you'll, you'll bear with me. My, my, my brief this evening um, is to address uh, the general trend towards increased censorship <coughs> and civic rights violations uh, in South Asia generally, and uh, in Pakistan more specifically. Manu tells me I have about eight to ten minutes. So I